let us look at the physiology first total body water as a percentage of the body weight so if we look at neonates their 80% body weight is water and this comes down to the adult percentage by around 18 years of age and in that also females have a lower percentage of body water uh, of body weight as water and males have slightly higher and the more the person is fat the lower the percentage of water is there in the body so by and large 80% in, an, in, in a neonate and 60% is the rough that is taken in an adult uh, of a body weight is water of this total body water two third is intracellular so 40% of an adult body weight is actually water inside the cells and only one third is outside again so this is 20% so if this 20%, 15% is in extravascular compartment and only 5% is in your blood vessels. So when we are trying to manipulate a patient's uh, fluids by giving IV fluids, remember that you are only playing around with this 5% by and large. Of course, there is constant exchange between this intravascular and extravascular and from the extracellular to the intracellular so ultimately if there is one compartment is dehydrated it is going to reflect in the intravascular also though it takes time right the same thing represented in a different way so the extracellular is only 20 percent of which Plasma is around 4.3% and interstitial fluid is around 15%. Intracellular water is across something known as the cell membrane is the intracellular water. And beyond that, we have minerals, proteins, glycogen and fat. Now, something very important is written right across here. And you must remember this when you are giving intravenous fluids. If you were to give colloids, it will distribute only here in the plasma. If you were to give in 0.9% saline or ringolactate, what we classically call crystalloids, it will go up to the extracellular compartment. Whereas if you were to give dextrose or dextrose saline, it will distribute right across because the cells need dextrose and they are going to use it up. Right? So, there are two reasons why you never use 5% dextrose or any dextrose containing fluid for resuscitation because number one, it doesn't stay within the compartment that you want to be replenished and number two, uh, it causes hyperglycemia, right? Again, a very important slide, our extracellular fluid is rich in sodium and chloride. Our intracellular fluid is rich in potassium, phos phosphorus, and of course, magnesium comes with them. It's not shown here. So this is also very important. And because of this, we will know something known as refading syndrome and the electrolyte imbalances associated with this. Right? Okay. So we come to a very nice article. The National Clinical Guidelines from the UK. This is way back in 2015 or so. They came up with a big document known as intravenous fluid therapy. And they have actually uh, given us five hours of IV fluid therapy. Resuscitation, routine maintenance, replacement and redistribution and reassessment. So whenever you're supposed to prescribe IV fluids, you need to know where does your patient lie? You first need to assess the patient's needs and use the appropriate algorithm. Do I need to resuscitate this patient? Do I need to give him routine maintenance? Does he need replacement because of redistribution or some losses? And always, always, is, as in everything else in medicine, there is always reassessment. Right? 
So how do we assess the patient's needs? We assess the state of hydration or dehydration or whatever. Of course, electrolytes are equally important when we try to assess a patient's needs because you all know that hypernatremia means fluid loss, hyponatremia means excess fluid. So resuscitation, if the patient is in shock, should be tuned to the condition. Not every patient will require similar kind of fluid. However, we'll come back to resuscitation later. Let us first talk about the routine maintenance. Now, routine maintenance depends on a lot of factors. So, what are the factors that decide my choice of volume of routine maintenance? Or, sorry, the choice and the volume of routine maintenance. So, can I hear some opinions from some of you? How do you decide? How do I choose what fluid to give? How do I decide what volume to give? I'm talking about routine maintenance. I'm not talking about resuscitation fluids. At least one or two points. Um, uh, that depends on patient. Um, uh, his hydration status. Because, uh, no, no, I'm talking about maintenance fluids. Maintenance fluids. Patients. So we uh, have a friend. Yes. Um, we uh, give maintenance fluid according to the 4 to 1 form formula as well as the, uh, we consider the weight of the patient and the mm -hmm. uh, state of hydration along with the state of acidosis or alkalosis present in the patient. Anything else? Blood so, sugar levels, electrolyte levels. Creatinine. Electrolyte levels, very important. So age is important if, the, if it's a child you'll give different amount of fluids if it's an adult you'll give different amount of fluids the weight of the patient the losses that are ongoing if you know that this patient has a pancreatic fistula you're going to give different kind of fluids as against a patient who has maybe uh, upper GI pathology and he's on a rice tube which is continuously draining out so the losses are important the temperature of the patient the underlying disease state whether he has got cardiac involvement or renal involvement, and whether you need to add nutrition or electrolytes. Yes or no? All these are important? Okay, I'll move ahead. Can you see the slides now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Right. So, age, gender, and weight. Now, we know that children are very different. They have higher body, body water. They have larger body surface area for the given weight. They have no glycogen store, store, so we need to give glucose. The margin of error is less. So we'll discuss a little bit about children, but I can't tell you everything about maintenance IV fluids in children. For an adult, normally we say 25 to 30 ml per kg per day of water. So approximately around 2 liters of fluid is what all of us require. We need to give some potassium, some sodium, some chloride, around 1 millimole per kg per day. And the minimum glucose, if you would like to prevent catabolism of your proteins, that the amount of glucose you should give is 5 grams per hour. And preferably use ideal body weight or predict body weight, not the actual body weight of the patient because that may be over or under. Right? We will not talk much more about that part. Gender, usually not very different. We come to losses. Now, a very important concept here is are the losses intracellular from the intracellular fluid compartment or is it the extracellular fluid compartment? I know that this is a very artificial division, but why is it important? Usually when we say intracellular, it is loss of free water. So insensible losses, renal losses, the hallmark is hypernatremia. And we need to replace with free water, which means something that does not contain sodium, does not contain chloride, something like a dextrose. Or if you can use the gut, you can just give plain water. And there are formulae, as you will learn in the course of these uh, uh, zero 01 course that you, there are formulae to understand what is the free water deficit 
but nothing should be unmonitored you have decided to give 2 liters but you should check the electrolytes and decide how soon your sodium is falling similarly isotonic losses like blood vomiting diarrhea burns extrafoliate dermatitis and distributional losses are all considered to be extracellular fluid loss compartment loss ultimately intravascular will get this depleted and intracellular compartment will also get depleted but the first choice in such patients is isotonic salt solutions right now very important diagram again it was in this very article very important for gi surgeons is what water is lost what kind of electrolyte is lost depending on the site of the loss so if it is upper gi then obviously we are going to lose different kind of things see vomiting nasogastric the fluid loss you will not be able to see this if you see this article it's very easily available uh, in the uh, uk uh, intravenous fluid therapy you will easily come to know what we are losing uh, biliary drain loss will be different pancreatic drain will be different and obviously inappropriate urinary loss or ongoing blood loss or dehydration and hyperventilation and fever will be a pure water loss so depending on what is lost your maintenance fluids will be different and your electrolytes will guide you in that so gi losses drains etc if you have we need to know what is being lost you may even estimate the electrolytes in the drain loss if it's a fistula or a stoma we know that electrolyte rich fluid is lost and more proximal the fistula greater the loss and replacement is guided by biochemical monitoring now as far as temperature is concerned we tend to forget that if the patient is having fever 12% increase in the fluid requirement per degree temperature above 37 degrees occurs so this is actually a huge loss if our patient is running high grade fever his insensible losses are huge this patient if you do not replace volume may end up in hypernatremia so actually one of the most important problems we face every day in our icu are patients with pancreatitis whether they are post op or whether they are pre op with drains they would be having hypernatremia the reason number 1 is this fever number 2 drain losses and if they are post operative they keep on having soakages which we do not take into account and invariably their insensible losses are high and these patients tend to become hypernatremic hypothermia the reverse occurs environmental temperature also we should increase the intake by around 30% for temperature above 31 degrees centigrade so in our hospital is air conditioned but think of other hospitals across india in the summer months how much that patient would be losing just because of environmental increase in environmental temperature regarding underlying disease of course i'm sure you all know this but what is important is this remember that there are non specific metabolic response to serious illness so what does the body do the body tends to conserve fluid there is increase in metabolism there is protein catabolism increase in cortisol adh aldosterone all lead to water and sodium retention this is a very uh, physiologically conserved response that whenever there is anything going wrong in the body any serious illness any injury conserve water conserve sodium so as a result of that we should realize that the patient may actually get water logged he may be water logged inside his body there is transcapillary leak of albumin loss of intracellular potassium and apart from this we have effect of specific organ system dysfunction drugs effect of restricted food intake and malnutrition so here is a huge table what disease does what but i'm sure most of you know that cardiac dysfunction renal dysfunction liver dysfunction we need to restrict volume because they are not able to handle what many of us do not realize that respiratory disease also 
can make patients vulnerable to fluid overload because of same SIDH mechanism. Whenever there is high respiratory rates, the swings in the intrathoracic pressure are interpreted in the atria as fluid deficits and then there is conservation of water and sodium. So acute illnesses, sepsis, dengue, we know there are increased fluid requirements. Pancreatitis, there is huge surge tracing. And ARDS, we know we should restrict uh, fluids as that leads to earlier liberation from ventilation. What is the effect of starvation on malnutrition? This is again very important and tells us exactly how uh, we get to refeeding syndrome. So whenever you have starvation or malnutrition, the action of the sodium potassium pump, which is highly dependent on energy, decreases. So sodium and water enter the cell, potassium, magnesium, calcium, phosphorus exit the cell. So edema ensues and all these electrolytes which have come out of the cell get excreted. Now you give the patient energy. What happens? Insulin is released. Sodium potassium pump gets activated and all these electrolytes, whatever is lying in the extracellular compartment is taken up by the cell. Sodium is excreted out of the cell. Now, as a result, there seems to be apparent fluid overload and severe deficiency of these intracellular electrolytes occurs. They can be life threatening unless we anticipate this and start supplementing early and keep checking the levels regularly. Patient can die of hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, or have malignant arrhythmias due to these deficiencies. So do not take this lightly. It can be life-threatening and it should be aggressively looked for and supplementation started as soon as you start feeding or simultaneously with feeding or in fact you can start even before. Now lastly, the additional needs for nutrition or electrolyte correction is equally important. Parental nutrition, we are very, very skeptical about it. We absolutely avoid it unless patient cannot be fed in the next five days. Don't take it lightly. It does lead to excessive infections in patients. Hypernatremia means there is fluid deficit. We need to replace free water. Hyponatremia means water retention. We need to restrict fluid and use sodium containing fluid. Hypokalemia should not be ignored. Look, correct aggressively. Always look for magnesium deficiency. Hypocalcemia usually need, does not need correction unless there is resistant shock or the patient is having symptoms. Hypophosphatemia, we know that now at least an IV preparation is available. Unfortunately, it also contains potassium. So unless your pot patient is potassium depleted, you cannot use this, but usually the patient who requires IV phosphorus also requires IV potassium. So it's a win-win situation, at least for us in the ICU. As far as your ABG values and, you know, disbelieving that the ABG gives us wrong reports of potassium, I think that practice should stop because if, if nothing, ABG will give you a trend and it will by and large be correct. And you should not ignore potassium values that come in the ABG. So what choice of fluids do you have? There is a wide choice of fluids, but we should have some rationale. So here is a table that I have put up. I'm sure this is available in most uh, textbooks, especially of anesthesia. So 0.9% saline is actually hardly normal as most of my colleagues would say it's called normal saline but it's really not normal because it has huge amounts of sodium but more than the sodium it has huge amounts of chloride and contains nothing else Hartmann's fluid or ringer lactate or whatever you'd like to call it has lesser chloride almost similar potassium a little less of course some potassium calcium etc etc and plasma light is now considered to be the wonder fluid the balanced fluid you know which has the least chloride and is the most favorite among intensivists across the globe dextrose 5% dextrose in water 
either with uh, normal saline or with 0.5% saline, um, 0.45, sorry, would obviously contain some glucose. Now, we will not talk about the other fluids because they are going to be covered in the next thing. But remember that these are all not innocuous, especially look at this, the half PNS. It has quite a huge amount of osmolarity, right? So if you were to add some fluid, some potassium or something to this, obviously the osmolarity of the fluid is going to go up and you would be giving it through a peripheral vein. It's not the easiest. Now, let's come to the resuscitation phase. Till now, we were talking about the maintenance phase. We'll talk of the resuscitation phase. In this, fluid has to be infused fast. So as I have explained, it should be glucose-free and potassium-free. Predominantly contains sodium and chloride. Choice is between saline, ringer, lactate, and balanced solution. Recent literature favors the use of chloride, uh, chloride-restricted fluid. So why? So here is a diagram which tells us what happens when you use, what does plasma contain? This is sodium, this is chloride, and these are the other aragare electrolytes, whereas saline is just sodium and chloride. And obviously, if you use this fluid, there will be rise in sodium, rise in chloride, and fall in pH. Whereas if you use lactated ringers, lactate, uh, lactated ringers, sorry, the sodium, it says will fall, but actually it doesn't fall. It should be kind of maintained. Chloride would remain same. pH would remain same. So this is a good fluid. But remember, if your patient is hyperkalemic, you cannot start with this fluid. Plasma light is supposed to mimic plasma. See, this is plasma. This is plasma light. So it's supposed to be similar. It maintains all the three electrolytes. What happens if you use saline? It's considered hyperinflammatory and so on and so forth. What is the major effect is supposed to be this, that chloride absorption leads to renal vasoconstriction. Delivery to the macula densa activates the tubular glomerular feedback, reducing GFR. So altogether, a GFR will fall and increase chances of AKI. But what does actually the literature say? So this is a meta-analysis of four big studies that came out in the last several years, starting, I think, in 2012 or so. The split trial, the SALT trial, the SALT-ED trial, and the SMART trial. All of them are said to be favoring balanced crystalloids. But actually, the meta-analysis also is kind of, okay, fine. I suppose if you have to use large volumes of fluid for resuscitation, it's a good idea to use balanced fluid somewhere after around a liter or so. But up to a liter, usually nothing happens. In the maintenance phase, glucose and all other electrolytes are required to be added. And routine maintenance fluids do not provide adequate calories. Mind you, should not be used for prolonged periods. We need to start enteral nutrition. What is replacement fluid? Replacement is when you are replacing any external losses, like you get a cholera patient, you are replacing the fluids that have been lost. It may be needed to add to the maintenance fluid. So the classic example is DKA, where you will calculate the losses plus maintenance for the deficit plus maintenance for the next, say, 48 hours or so, and then you will give that fluid over the next 48 hours. So remember that this is how you should plan replacement. You need to take into account stoma losses, high urine output, loose motions, burns, etc., etc. And it is mandatory to monitor electrolytes because that would tell you what composition of IV fluids to be given. What is redistribution? It means there is redistribution internal losses. Sepsis, post-operative state, we have a third spacing. Now, here comes a very important concept. Extravascular lung water, abdominal hypertension. So when you give fluids to a patient who has leaky capillaries, his lung capillaries tend to leak. 
and he ends up getting extra vascular lung water which will make him tachypneic and ultimately end up giving him ARDS. Similarly, his intra-abdominal contents tend to leak. He tends to develop intra-abdominal hypertension and this can make life very miserable because then this will compromise the IVC, fall in venous return, it will push up the diaphragm, patient is going to find it difficult to breathe and it will also compromise the renal vasculature and lead to oliguria and AKI. So it is a very difficult situation and one must always be aware of it. We have seen it often in patients with dengue or in patients with pancreatitis. So be watchful of this condition. It's not a simple condition and it should not be ignored. Cardiac, renal or liver disease. There is often difficulty in handling excess fluid. So one should always be careful when we are giving big volumes of fluid to these patients. In fact, we should not give big volumes of fluid to these patients. So this is the algorithm that I'm talking about. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of it. So this is your assessment. You decide where your patient fits in. Does he require fluid resuscitation? If yes, you go down this path. If no, does he require routine maintenance or replacement and redistribution or just he, does he require anything else or just a reassessment? So each of the algorithms can be expanded, but I will not definitely go through them. Uh, there was one more. Yeah, this is what I wanted to show. So this is how the cycle goes on. You assess, you decide whether he needs resuscitation. If yes, you resuscitate and then reassess. Is he adequately resuscitated? No ongoing losses. So then you move to routine maintenance. But if something goes wrong, he has a new loss, he may go back to the resuscitation phase. While in routine maintenance, it may happen that there was inadequate maintenance or there were ongoing losses. So you needed replacement or redistribution was there. And if not, maybe while he was on replacement or redistribution, you had adequate replacement. So you went back to routine maintenance and finally on to oral maintenance. So like this, the cycle goes on. It requires reassessment at all stages. And we'll just talk a few things about how to monitor patients on IV fluids. So anybody, what do you monitor when you are giving IV fluids? Someone wants to tell me something? Urine output, ma'am. Urine output, very good. Electrolytes. Electrolytes. Yes. Anything else? I see. I caliber. Central venous pressure. Central venous pressure. Somebody said something else. ABG. Yeah, it will tell you electrolytes, it will tell you acidosis status. So, there are simple tools. Simplest tool is what your nurse does an intake output record. But it's actually, there are lots of debates. People say it should be thrown out of the window. Well, it's not so bad. Maybe you can keep a target of around 200, 300, 400 positive every day because we know that everybody has insensible losses. And when you tap a large amount of a pleural or recitic fluid, it's not as if that had accumulated in one day. So you need not count that for replacement. Or maybe at least you count a small part of it. You may all laugh when you see this weight record for fluid therapy. But that is very important. And it is absolutely mandatory in neonatal practice. Are there any neonatologists in the course? I saw some names. Okay. Nephrologists also believe in weighing patients to know how much of fluid they have removed after a dialysis and so on and so forth. So it is a very good uh, measure. It's just that it is difficult to do it, especially if the patient is not ambulatory. These are also very cheap alternatives to urine specific gravity. Urine and serum osmolarity can be done bedside. But we are just too lazy not to do it. But electrolytes are important, especially serum sodium levels are absolutely mandatory if you're giving IV fluids for any reason for prolonged periods. CVP has gone out of the window. Its value is absolutely hopelessly inaccurate. 
the trend and response to a fluid bolus is more representative and PA catheter is absolutely not required now. So we have a lot of dynamic indices in an ICU setting, echocardiography, passive leg raising, many others. What most of our residents would do, look at the ventricular chambers, look at the IVC and see how it changes with respiration and that will give you an idea of what the fluid status is. They call it kissing chambers if the ventricles are absolutely empty and the ventricles are touching each other when they contract. So that will give you an idea of the volume status. It's not very difficult. Uh, nobody does uh, very fancy measurements. It's just an eyeballing. If you actually want to do fancy measurements, then you need to do some, have some fancy gadgets as well. So it's not, uh, it's not a, every day that you need to do it. Adverse effects, presence of edema, ascites, pleural effusion, electrolytes and blood gases, lung ultrasound, B lines indicate wet lungs, and as I said, intra-abdominal pressure. So just a very small talk about pediatric patients. Fluid intake should be given per kg body weight. Glucose, they do not have glycogen stores, especially children below 5. So you always need to add glucose to the maintenance fluid requirements. They are more prone to develop hyponatremia if they are unnecessarily given large amounts of hypotonic fluid. Can you name some hypotonic fluids? Anybody? Plain dextrose. Plain dextrose, D5. of course. Anything else? Half DNS? Yes? Half DNS is also hypotonic. So basically, there is a huge amount of literature today starting from around 15-20 years ago that if you were to treat a child below 10 kg weight, maybe half DNS with some KCL added to it is the best maintenance fluids. If the weight is above 10 kg, perhaps DNS. The formula that I used as somebody before this said 4 to 1, that's a good formula. But the classic fluid that has been recommended across the globe is isolite P. This is a very, very hypotonic fluid. This is N by 5. So, one fifth normal saline, and it contains a host of other electrolytes like potassium, magnesium, and all that. The other electrolytes are all good. Unfortunately, the sodium contained is too little, and this is very dangerous for children, especially if given in large amounts. So, this is not the choice of maintenance IV fluids for children. That's very, very important. If you have to take one message from this entire lecture, I'd advise you to take this. So that's about it. I